Good morning. For those that I've not met before, my name's Pete. Together with my wife, B. we lead the church here at KXC, so massive welcome if you're new. We're continuing a teaching series, hopefully slides will be up on the screen, entitled With Me, A Journey Through Psalm 23. So a little whoop for those that are excited about jumping into Psalm 23. That's at least um, a tenth of the room, which is great. And um, Why don't we stand together? We're going to read Psalm 23. Every week we're going to read this psalm together. Hopefully at the end of seven weeks we'll have memorized it by heart. So let's say... The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Holy Spirit, as we walk through this passage from Scripture, would you come and inspire our thinking, um, enlarge our hearts. May we encounter you in this journey. And all God's people say I'm man, feel free to take a seat. So this morning is going to feel like drinking from a fire hose. Um, I haven't got a water can to gently sprinkle you with content. Um, so open mouths wide, fire hose is on its way. There will be a lot of content coming your way. Um, but my sense is that you're not just going to survive this. You're going to absolutely love it. You're going to get drenched in the process. And I hope that you encounter God on the journey. But theologically, buckle in, brace because we're going to jump right in and we're jumping into the deep end. Okay, so the first point I want to make as we journey forward is to highlight the beautiful journey towards intimacy in this passage. And I want to highlight that through the use of pronouns, which is really nerdy, you know, academically. Um, we're going to look at the different pronouns in Psalm 23. That's my academic voice, by the way. Um, but something profound is going on and I want to highlight it to you. So we start with the Lord and then just notice the, the third person pronoun here. Um, the focus on what the Lord does for us, that he makes me lie down and he leads me and he refreshes my soul and he guides me. And because of what he's done, I can walk even through the darkest valleys and I needn't fear evil. And then notice the movement further into the heart of God. It's no longer he, like aware of God being with David as he writes this psalm, that he becomes you. You are with me and you prepare a table and you anoint my head with oil. And surely your goodness and love will follow me. And then it lands with our response to this moment of encounter that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The point is, if we really want to encounter God, and I believe we do, it starts when we take our eyes off ourselves, our circumstances, and focus on him as our good shepherd and what he's doing in our lives. And as we focus on him, we're drawn into this encounter where we start to talk to God and say, you and you, and because you're like this, I can be like this. So you may have seen me use this diagram before this is the process of transformation that it all starts with the character and nature of God and from the overflow of God's being he acts towards us he cannot be inconsistent with his character he is God so everything he does is consistent with his identity from the overflow of his being he acts towards us and his activity towards us particularly in the life death and resurrection of Jesus it transforms our being Paul would say, because of what Christ has done, we are a new creation. And from the overflow of our new identity, we begin to act in the world. We become the hands and feet of Jesus. Our concern is often our identity and our activity. And when we begin to engage with those questions disconnected from God, i.e. the culture around us, we get in real, real trouble, right? 
Our deepest need is to encounter God as he is, to fix our eyes on him, to contemplate his character, his nature, and how he acts towards us. And that's what Psalm 23 is constantly doing. You are like this, and you are like that, and because of your activity towards me, I don't need to fear evil anymore. So as you go through Psalm 23, the focus is on the character and nature of God. In fact, there are eight compound names of God throughout the Old Testament. And one of them is named in line one, Yahweh Rahi, the Lord is my shepherd. Now throughout the Old Testament, I said there's eight compound names. One is explicitly named in Psalm 23. The other seven are implicit in the structure of the psalm. So let's briefly go through it. The Lord is my shepherd, Yahweh Rahi. I lack nothing. The name in scripture is Yahweh Jireh or Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is my provider. And if the Lord is my provider, I have everything I need in him. And he's the one that leads me towards quiet waters. Yahweh Shalom. Yahweh is my peace. Like struggling with anxiety, come to Jesus. He is our peace. He restores my soul. Yahweh Rafa, Yahweh my healer. He's the one that guides me along the right paths. Yahweh Sid Canoe. Yahweh my righteousness. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Yahweh Shema. Yahweh Shema literally means the Lord is with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh my banner. In other words, you're the one I run to in the midst of battle. And finally, you anoint my head with oil, Yahweh M. Kadesh, Yahweh who sanctifies me, sets me apart. Like hidden in this one psalm are all of the names of Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. Do you think David was interested in the character and nature of God? tough crowd the answer is yes obsessed with the character and nature of God because from the overflow of his being he acts towards us his activity towards us transforms our identity and from the overflow of our identity we begin to act in the world we should become obsessed with the character and nature of God what he's like and how he acts towards us so today we're going to zoom in on these two verses the Lord is my shepherd Yahweh Rahi I lack nothing in other words he's my provider Yahweh Jireh, and he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters to a place of peace, Yahweh Shalom. We're going to unpack these two characteristics of the nature of God. So let's, let's look firstly at Yahweh Jireh. Um, the verb Jireh, the Hebrew verb Jireh, literally means to see. So Yahweh Jireh, put these two together, literally means the Lord will see to it. Now our translations in the Bible will say, the Lord our provider. But a closer translation would be, Yahweh will see to it. And I, I love this, because this is the kind of language that I often use towards our kids. When our kids are in a moment of panic, but dad, how are we going to get from this party to the football match we need to get? Don't worry, chill out. Daddy will see to it. But dad, how are we going to do this and that? It's all right. Calm down. Daddy will see to it. And I often picture God in my moments of prayer when I'm freaking out about these concerns and those concerns. I often just imagine God saying, it's all right, Pete, chill out. Daddy will see to it. Like if you're in a moment of high anxiety, maybe you need to encounter God and hear that voice spoken over you. It's all right. It's all right. Daddy will see to it. The Lord will see to it. The Lord will provide. Think of the language of provision. Again, this is another compound word. Two words shoved together to form a new word. Pro, meaning beforehand. Vision, meaning to see. Put them together. It's to see beforehand. So listen to these words. This is from a, an Anglican minister, theologian from another generation. Um, the Rev. Webb Peplow says this. With God, to see is also to foresee. As the one who possesses eternal wisdom and knowledge, he knows the end from the beginning. From eternity to eternity, he foresees everything. Thus with God, foreseeing is prevision. Having prevision of man's sin and fall and need, he makes 
provision for that need. For provision, after all, is merely a compound of two Latin words. We've done that work. Meaning to see beforehand. And we may learn from a dictionary that provide is simply the verb and prevision the noun of seeing beforehand. Thus, to God, prevision is necessarily followed by provision, for he certainly will provide for that which his foreseeing shows him to exist. With him, prevision and provision are one and the same thing. Some of you are thinking, say, what? Like, what? Um, let me summarize it with that last statement. With God, prevision and provision are one and the same thing. Now, the challenge for us is we often can't see what is ahead. And because we can't see, that creates uncertainty, and the uncertainty creates anxiety. Problem number one. Problem number two is sometimes we can see what's ahead. And our panic at that point is that we don't have the inner resources like to take on what lies ahead. It's a capacity issue. And because we don't have the capacity, that creates anxiety and we end up in a moment of panic. This is the great news about the nature of God is he sees beforehand. There is no uncertainty, right? He sees what's coming and he has all the resources necessary to tackle what is coming your way. He wants to speak over you. It's all right. Yahweh will see to it. It's all right, you don't need to panic. Daddy will see to it. I see what's coming. I've got all the resources, prevision, provision. I've got this, you're good. Yahweh will see to it. Now, the question that rises from this name is, is what will Yahweh see to? So if you've got a Bible, turn to John chapter 3, um, the story of Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Hopefully it'll appear on the screen so you can follow it on the screen. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, pause. He came to Jesus at night. Now, throughout John's gospel, like darkness and light are major, major themes. So when John is emphasizing that Nicodemus came at night, you know there's going to be some sort of like comparing the night with the light, the night um, with the day, which is exactly what's about to happen. So he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see Seeing is what happens in the day, right? No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Great question. Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born again. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Now, what's going on in this conversation is Nicodemus like, is coming to Jesus at nighttime with a yearning for the light. He wants to be in on this activity that Jesus is in on, like the new creation breaking in upon them, the light of the age to come breaking into the darkness and the life of the age to come breaking into a scene of death. I want in on this. How can I get in on this? And Jesus says, you need to be born again. And then they engage in this conversation. And in that conversation, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, perhaps the most known verses from Scripture. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want you to try and engage with this journey of Nicodemus, coming from the darkness, yearning for the light. Like, I want in on this. I want to taste this life of the age to come that's breaking in upon us. Like, how? How? Who's going to provide for this deep yearning in my soul to be in the light and experience everlasting life? And Jesus um, begins to speak these words. Now, beneath these words is a Jewish story. Now, just to unpack the story that sits beneath um, these words, to, to understand what's going on here, you need to know that in the early centuries, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, used a principle to unpack the scriptures. And the principle was called the principle of first mention. If you want to know what a word means in the Bible, you go back to the first time that word is ever used, and the first use illuminates meaning. Right. So when Jesus says, for God so loved the world and then uses this phrase, one and only son, immediately Nicodemus is thinking Genesis 22. And I could see many of you where you 
you're like, wow, love, oh, one and only son, Genesis 22. I, you got that. I could see it. Um, but Nicodemus knows because he spends his life unpacking the scriptures. As he hears Jesus talk about love, one and only son, he's suddenly in the story of Abraham with his son, Isaac. So we just need to enter that story for, for one moment. Now, the build up to Genesis 22 is God saying to Abraham, I'm choosing you to become a father um, Even though you can't have kids, humanly speaking, you're going to become a father to a nation. And through that nation, my plan to renew all things will come to pass. My plan for the reconciliation and renewal of the entire cosmos, it will come to pass through your offspring, through your family. Now, the question for Abraham is like, how? Like, how are you going to see to that? Like, what? How are you going to provide? So in Genesis 12, God first makes the promise, Abraham 75. He says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'll bless you so you will be a blessing. Genesis 13, there's a reminder of the promise. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. If it could be counted, then so could your offspring be counted. And you can imagine Abraham and his wife, Sarah, like human speaking, can't have kids. They're like, we don't need like a multitude, just one. Like one, one is a great starting point, right? We're struggling to have one. So the promises of like multitudes, let's start with the one. Genesis 15, God reminds Abraham again. Look at the stars. If you can count them, then you can count your offspring. That's 10 years after the promise, right? Like we struggle with waiting, right? When God promises, we're like, we want it now. We want it now. Sometimes we have to engage in the painful activity of waiting. The story continues. Abraham takes matters into his own hands. He takes his wife's maidservant, sleeps with her. They have a child, Ishmael. But Ishmael wasn't the child of the promise. So in Genesis 17, you have another reminder. Abraham's 99. This is 24 years after the promise. And God reminds him, says, you will be the father of many nations. Sarah will have a boy. Now, Sarah's in her 90s. And both of them are like, all these promises, they keep coming. It's like every prophetic gathering. I just, you at the back, why don't you stand? I said, this, I'm just imagining how it might have been. There's no one at the back, by the way. Everyone's turning. <laughs> Some panic at the back. But you can imagine every prophetic moment, it's like, yep, you're going to be a father to the nation. It's like so many promises. How is it going to come to pass? And then you have this story. And the story, when Isaac eventually arrives, this moment of celebration, they have a child, the beginning of this line, right? And then God says, I want you to sacrifice the child for me, which feels like this incredibly intense moment in the story. And it would take a whole sermon to unpack that. You need to know God was never going to sacrifice Isaac. What he was trying to draw out from Abraham is, Abraham, will you trust me with the thing most precious to you? And it's revealed through the story that Abraham's response is yes. And his faith is credited to him as righteousness in right relationship with God. So Abraham basically takes his son Isaac up this mountain, is getting ready to sacrifice his son. And then this happens. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now, the boy is basically on essentially an altar getting ready to be sacrificed. So do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place and notice the language, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, this is a moment of breakthrough, a moment of encounter, where Abraham is asking the question, all these promises, not just about you having a child, but that through this child and through this nation, you're going to renew and redeem all things. How is it going to come to pass? And he has this moment of revelation, and the revelation is the name and the character of God. Yahweh will see to it. It's all right, Abraham. You don't need to understand exactly how this is going to come to pass. All you need to know is that Yahweh will see to it. And just notice that the language here, it isn't Yahweh has provided. Oh, he provided a ram. Thank you, Lord. It isn't Yahweh has provided. It's more than that. Abraham in this moment points forward and says, Yahweh will provide. 
On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, let's just look forward then with Abraham. A number of Jewish scholars um, make this parallel in this text between Isaac and Jesus. When we think of this story, we think of Isaac as a a little boy, right? Maybe a five, six-year-old, like completely unaware of what's happening. Most scholars would say that Isaac would have been in his early 30s. So think a grown man in the story, right? And Jesus, as he journeys up Calvary in his early 30s. Verse 6 of the the story um, in Genesis 22, Isaac carries the wood upon which he is to be sacrificed. And suddenly in your mind, think of Jesus as he climbs up the mountain of Golgotha, carrying the wood upon his shoulders upon which he's going to be crucified. Think of the obedience of Isaac. If he's in his 30s, as most scholars would suggest, like this is a moment of incredible trust and obedience in his father. Right? If, if he wanted to wrestle himself free, who's going to win a wrestle between a 30-year-old man and a man well into his hundreds? Again, tough crowd. The answer is the guy in his 30s. So when Isaac lies down on essentially this altar, this is a moment of unbelievable trust and obedience. And think of Jesus in Gethsemane like, Lord, is there another way? Can you take this cup of suffering from me? Yet not my will be done, but yours. And then think of Moriah, the mountain. Yahweh will provide. And again, a number of scholars suggest that that very same mountain is where Jesus was crucified at Calvary. That very same mountain where Abraham prophetically looked forward and said, Yahweh will provide is the very same place where Yahweh did provide. Provide his one and only son, right, whom he loved, to die so that our sins could be separated from us as far as the east is from the west, to overcome all darkness, to overcome death. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting, right? The, the point here is that God cares about your urgent needs, like your daily bread, but he satisfi- satisfies your ultimate needs. The things you need most in life, the Lord would want to speak over you. Yahweh will see to it. Yahweh will see to it. So the question for Nicodemus in this encounter, back to John's Gospel chapter 3, is I want in on the light of the age to come. I want in on the life of the age to come. Like, how can I live life fully? Now, we know the answer is Jesus. Spoiler, the answer is going to be Jesus in the, black, in the blank, by the way. Um, we might believe that, but many of us live as functional atheists. So we will proclaim Jesus is the pathway to fullness of life. Yet how we live might communicate a different set of beliefs, right? So let's just try and fill in the blanks. And we're going to use um, some language from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, where Paul says, for me to live is blank to die is blank and we're going to fill in the blanks so what about wealth that's probably a story some of us are living in right fullness of life is found in my possessions my wealth Um, how would Paul fill in the blanks well for me to live is wealth to die is to be broke you can't take your house into the new creation you can't take your savings with you and you can't take your possessions with you So if that's the story you live in, the end of the story is going to be pretty desperate. What about fullness of life is found in success? Well, for me to live is success, to die is to fail. You can't take your medals with you into the new creation. You can't take your titles and you can't take your trophies, right? You're going to have to leave all that behind. For me to live is success, to die is to fail. What about marriage? For me to live is marriage, to die is to be alone. If you idolize marriage, you'll end up with a broken heart. Because even when you get married, what do you say in your vows? Till death us do part. There's only one marriage in the new creation, and it's the church to Jesus Christ. That's the union that counts most. What about fullness of life is to be found in fame? For me to live is fame. To die is to be forgotten. You can't take your Twitter followers your social media followers, into the new creation. And we can laugh about it, but some of us are living in that story where you're defined by how, you know, you're perceived 
by your reputation. The only way to fill in the blanks is to say, which is what Paul did say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like the first part of the sentence, the only way to get to a plus at the end, gain, is to, is to put Christ in the first part of the sentence. For me to live is Christ, because if I'm living right now, I have union with him, that's win. But if I die, I experience a greater union with him, that's gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Fullness of life is found in Jesus. God cares about your urgent needs, um, yeah, urgent needs, which is why we pray for God to give us each day our daily bread. But what he's most concerned by are your ultimate needs. And the ultimate needs that drive you, he wants to encounter you in that place, right? So back into the Abraham story, the question is, how are these promises going to come to pass, right? And, and what you need to know is every promise of Scripture is fulfilled in Christ. Every promise of scripture is yes and amen in Christ. Oh, your promises are... There we go. It's a song, but it's also a word from scripture. um, That basically, when you are walking through challenging situations, here's a bit of advice, right? When you're going through adversity, find a promise of scripture and let that be an anchor, right? If it's a promise that's not found in scripture, all the best. But it... If it's a promise found in scripture, you can guarantee that that promise is yes in Christ. It will come to pass. God is faithful. This is what Paul says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen, which is basically yes, our yes, is spoken by us to the glory of God. So moments of uncertainty, we hold on to the promise and say, God, you've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And we're going to say yes and amen to that. And you promised that you have a plan to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope in the future. And we say yes and amen to that. And we keep standing. Standing on the promises of God, knowing that they are yes in Christ Jesus. Augustine put it this way, God, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Right? So, so when you live without Christ, this is what Augustine's saying, what you experience is a deep restlessness at a soul level. And he wrote his famous book, Confessions, articulating the spiritual wrestle in his soul before he encountered Christ. And when he encountered Christ, the language that he could best use to articulate it was like, ah, I feel at rest now. All my life I've been restless, right? Now this feels like green pastures, still waters, it feels like rest. Here's the two ways to live. Just want to put it really starkly. Option number one, when you're in that moment of uncertainty, when you're in a spot of adversity, here's your two options. Trust, i.e. dependence, on the character and nature of God. His voice spoken over us. Yahweh will see to it. That's the story of Isaac. Yahweh will see to it. Option number two is it's on you. And the mindset is, I will see to it. I'm going to have to provide for my needs and I'm going to have to provide for my family's needs and I'm going to have to pay the bills on the new mortgage and and the new energy bills. It's on me and the weight on your shoulders, it just begins to stack up to the point where you feel exhausted and broken, right? But that's the way many of us choose to live. The mindset beneath it, which is the story of Ishmael, is I'm going to have to see to this. This is on me. The invitation of God is like, can I just reveal my nature and my name? Like Yahweh Jara, Yahweh will see to it. It's okay, you don't need to worry. Daddy will see to it. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Very briefly then, coming into land, verse two. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. We said last week um, that sheep only lie down when they've been fed and watered. Trying to get sheep to lie down when it hasn't been fed and watered, incredibly challenging. Haven't tried, but I'm told. Incredibly challenging, right? They only sit down when they've been fed and when they've been watered, when they are safe and when they are satisfied, right? In other words, when they are content. Now, we are all searching for contentment. We know we are. We long to be in that place, to borrow the language of Augustine, that place of rest. How do we get there? 
right? So let me just close with these words from Paul again from his letter to the church in Philippi. Paul says, I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Another translation says, I've learned the key to contentment. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul says, and it's kind of a boast, and we might miss this, it's kind of a really cocky boast in the context of the first century. Because in the first century, it was dominated by Greek philosophers. And one of the strands of Greek philosophy was Stoicism. Right? And, and the highest pursuit of Stoic philosophy was contentment. The Greek word is autarkies. In, in, in Stoic philosophy, they were trying to find contentment. Has anyone found the key to contentment? And Paul says, yeah, I found the key. Right? So the best of the Stoic philosophers, they claim to be close to finding the key to autarkies, right? but fell short. And this is, this is what they got to. This is some of their teaching of Stoic philosophy. They, they basically said, if you want to achieve this state of autarkies, like bliss, contentment, here's what you need to do. Number one, eliminate all desire. They believed that contentment consisted not in possessing much, but in wanting little. If you want to make a man happy, add not to his possessions, but take away from his desires, right? So if you want to hit this point of autarky's contentment, you need to desire nothing. All the best. Desire nothing. Secondly, and I find this one actually quite funny. Eliminate all emotion. Epictetus, a stoic philosopher, says this. Begin with a cup or a household utensil. If it breaks, say, I don't care. I, I think I could do that. <laughs> Go on to a horse or a pet dog, and I have Rosie our cockapoo in mind. If anything happens to, to it, say, I don't care. And that's where I get off the strain. Go on to yourself, and if you're hurt or injured in any way, say, I don't care. Right, this is a journey that you have to go on, of teaching yourself not to care and not to feel. Right? If you go on long enough, and if you try hard enough, you'll come to a stage where you can watch your nearest and dearest suffer and die and say... I don't care. I don't care. And, and Paul basically says, and, and this is huge, this Stoic philosophy in terms of the context of, of Greece and therefore the context of Philippi, this town in northern Greece. Um, Paul is basically saying, if you eliminate desire and you eliminate emotion, you won't be content. You will be dead. That, that, that's not contentment. That is death, right? And there was a spirit of death all around Greece because they were going after this. Paul says, can I actually tell you what the true key to contentment is? You don't eliminate desire. You point it to Jesus, your good shepherd. He says, I want to know Christ. I'm not eliminating my desires. I am pointing them to Jesus. I want to know more of him. This is like my one goal. I'm pressing on towards this one thing. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. He's the one through which God spoke. Yahweh will see to it. Every promise is yes and amen in him. I want to know Christ. And secondly, rather than eliminating emotion and being emotionally dead, Paul says something really bold. He says, I, I want to know and participate in the sufferings of Christ because I also want to participate in the joy of his resurrection power. In other words, I choose to feel. I choose to feel the pain and the cost of living in this moment where we experience the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. I want to embrace the pain because I know that I'm also going to embrace the joy of resurrection, life and power. And because of that, and remember the context, Paul is writing this from prison, right? You'd have thought high levels of discontent in prison, but he's like, hey, just to let you know, I found the key to contentment. And in the context of Greece, what? He's found the key to our darkies? Well, what is it? What is it? I want to know Christ. And I want to follow his journey in his footsteps from death to resurrection life. So if we were to paraphrase everything we've journeyed through um, this morning, to paraphrase um, the first two verses, I would paraphrase it like this. This is like the message translation 2.0. This isn't Eugene Peterson. This is Father Pedro. So it's not quite batting at the same level. But let's, let's just go there. The Lord is my shepherd. I found the key to contentment. Right, which sounds arrogant to claim something like that. But if you've really encountered Jesus as the shepherd, you can say, I found the key to contentment safe and satisfied in him. I can now experience rest for my soul. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I found the key to contentment. Safe and satisfied in him, I can now experience rest for my soul. How is all this going to happen? It's all right. Yahweh will see to it. Yahweh will see to it. Every promise is yes and amen in Christ. Why don't we stand?